Here we are at the finish line. It's been a year full of bombings, pandemics, big storms, worst of all, dissertations. But here we are. But it's not all been doom and gloom, and we have reported on some uplifting and light-hearted stories this year. So come and join us as we look back from our favourite moments from the past year. Thanks everyone for joining us. I'm Ryan Gorman. And I'm Kitty Vavasor, jo joined by our sports presenter Tess Penman. Hello. We kicked off the year with an exclusive interview with Serena Kennedy, the new Chief Constable of Merseyside. Tess, you attended her talk. How did that go? It was a bit tense. We asked her a few questions about like the rise in hate crime in the city centre and racial profiling and the the trying to recruit more people in the police force, but she was quite prepared for our questions and she said afterwards to the other officers that she got a grill on from us, so I think we did quite well. Oh, well, there you go. Here's the final piece put together by today's director, Romy Grigg, and cameraman slash editor, Joe Foley. Merseyside Chief Constable Serena Kennedy announced her six-part strategy for Merseyside's police force in her annual speech at Liverpool John Moores University. She gave an exclusive interview to Mersey News Live before the speech, highlighting her aim of prevention of crime is better than cure, with a focus on the force building community relationships. She also defended the purchase of the £46 million new police headquarters in Merseyside. One of my priorities as Chief Constable is absolutely about community engagement. That's both from, uh, from a partnership perspective and from our community and community's perspective. So the headquarters will enable closer working relationships internally and externally. The Chief Executive from the College of Policing, Andy Marsh, gave his opinion on what he was expecting from Chief Constable Kennedy's speech. I think it's important that she's picked on prevention as one of the first things she wants to talk about. And actually when you look at the Pelian principles of policing, prevention is one of the, the first uh, principles. And the sign of a good police force is one where there's an absence of crime, not necessarily just where you're catching criminals. I would expect if the Chief Constable is serious about this, to see an operating model where it was very clear who was meant to be doing prevention, and it's too easy to say everyone. So who, how, and what evidence base do you draw upon, and how is it measured? We are the pebble, the partners and us are the pebble that create the ripples, so we've got some really good examples. What I want is to deliver that in, in, in every community, so you get that really close working relationship. It needs more resources and it needs additional funding. In the meantime, the Chief pledged to continue what she calls the relentless pursuit of criminals who blight the lives of our communities. Romy Grigg, Mersey News Live. Shockingly, in October, our very own presenter Kitty was a victim of the spiking pandemic, ironically the day after Kitty reported on the issue for Mersey News Live. Life is coming under scrutiny from the police and the Home Office as alleged incidents of drinking injection spiking multiply. Merseyside Police have confirmed they've investigated five alleged cases of injections and 17 of drink spiking since the 1st of September. Online images have been circulating of girls claiming they've been injected with an unknown substance whilst on a night out, reportedly waking up the next morning with a needle mark, or in other cases waking up with no knowledge of how they got home or even leaving the nightclub. LGMU student Ellen Jones believed she was a victim of drink spiking whilst recently on a night out in Liverpool. It was some, Somebody gave me a shot. and at the time, I never usually take shots, but on that night I did and he just gave me the shot and then he just walked away and I thought oh that's a bit weird and then, then about 10-15 minutes later I was like oh and I just felt weird and I just felt like when I was walking I, I felt I was like I was like floating and then apparently I blacked out like I was on I was on the floor in Bold Street for like an hours until I got carried home basically and then I woke up and I just don't remember what happened in Bull Street or anything. These attacks are not always limited to nighttime venues. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. We drank the drink, and that's the last thing I personally remember. My friends then put me in a taxi because uh, I couldn't walk. My legs had given way by this point, and I was barely conscious. Um, my friend rang me 10 minutes later, and the police answered my phone and told them I was on Regent Street. Um, and completely unconscious. Very humiliating. I was lying in my own vomit in the street. I was spiked with GHB, uh, which is like a traditional date, date rape drug. It's a very scary experience, especially as it happened in broad daylight in one of the most tourist heavy areas of London. 
and they've potentially just got away with it. 200 drink spiking incidents have been reported on, but there are doubts surrounding the claims that needles are being used, as journalist Sophia Smith-Gayler has discovered. Guy Jones, senior scientist at drugs charity The Loop, said injecting adds a big what factor to the whole thing because few drugs would be able to be injected like this. One common spiking drug, he says, would be a poor candidate for injection due to the large amount of fluid needed and therefore the thick, painful needle. This means that the substance involved would be something that would be highly detectable for several days in a toxicology screening. But then an emergency medicine consultant told us there are a couple of things that are disconcerting about the story. The technical and medical knowledge required to perform this would make this deeply improbable. Meanwhile, Murderside Police say they are still investigating three reports of attacks on young girls and so every case will be taken seriously. Kitty Vavasor for Mersey News Live. Over the years, Liverpool has been at the heart of many major news stories, such as Hillsborough and James Bolger. These are etched into the city's history, and only last week, a 15-year-old girl was shot while waiting for a bus home from school. And on November 25th, the city went into mourning for 12-year-old Ava White, tributes marking the spot where she died as hundreds of others gathered to watch the switching on of the Christmas lights. We also can't forget the city has experienced its first terrorist attack since the 70s. Rhoda and Giovanna, you were at the women's hospital during the aftermath. Can you tell us about the experience and what it was like reporting there? I think it was a very surreal experience. Everyone was quite shocked at what happened to the city here in Liverpool. I think no one expected something like this to happen. And I mean, with all the nervousness, I, mm, that was... <laughs> that was a present, I think. Um, it was quite scary at the beginning, but I were, uh, a lot of us were reassured because of police presence and because of how the investigation went on. So you felt safe the whole time? I think at the beginning it wasn't as... Um, I, I mean, Jivan and I didn't feel as safe, having been there for four days uh, since the incident happened. But later on, I think the police presence allowed us to, I guess reassure ourselves that yes something is happening yes they're taking control here's a package about that on remembrance sunday a terrorist attack took place in liverpool city center the passenger ahmad al swilmeen was declared dead at the scene after detonating the bomb the taxi driver david perry managed to escape the car and was treated for injuries since then more than forty thousand pounds has been raised for him as a show of thanks and support from the public Four men were arrested in connection with the car explosion that evening, but were released shortly after, and the Prime Minister increased the terror threat level from substantial to severe. The incident has left the community concerned for their welfare. LGMU Vice-Chancellor of Strategic Initiatives, Phil Vickerman, said steps have been put in place to protect the university. There's not been significant sort of issues of, 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 of concern raised by students. We have had staff that have asked us um, what further things we're doing um, or and some of it is just reinforcing what we're doing but also um, demonstrating that you know we are taking you know appropriate actions you know um, as need be. The attack was the first of its nature to occur in Liverpool. We can only hope it will be the last. Kitty Vavasor from Mersey News Live. And it's not just news, we've also been covering the big sporting moments throughout the year. Tess, over to you. It's been a successful year already for Liverpool. They beat Chelsea on penalties to win the Carabao Cup last week at Wembley. They're in the upcoming quarterfinals for the FA Cup and the knockout stage in the Champions League and still in a title race at Man City. And Everton have been Everton. They're one point away from the relegation zone and they still have to play United, Chelsea and the Mersey rivals. But my personal sport and achievement this year was interviewing Jamie Carragher about the importance of the Alder Hay neonatal unit. In December, we threw on our festive jumpers and Santa came early with the gift of Steve, Kate and Shirley singing. Some Christmas Gorgeous vocal, Shirley. <laughs> in February, Liverpool was hit by a number of storms, making for challenging conditions for the public and presenters alike. The rain, I think the mix of the rain the and the people year, just Joseph, hit to work all at the same time just was a nightmare getting through. Storm barriers and swing all across the UK. It's been said that Merseyside's going to be avoiding the front of it, but as you can see, it's still been pretty badly affected. 
Cheshire's been issued with the yellow weather warning. North Wales can be facing winds up to 70 miles per hour. So be ready for a gusty week ahead of you. Back to you in the studio. From the last year, Joe Zebedee, we've already seen you in your car facing the weather, but what are you most proud of this year? I am most proud of my Thornton post office story. It took a few weeks to get ready. I spent a lot of time in the village of Thornton going around trying to get box pops, getting shots of the village. And I eventually got an interview with the, co with the leader of the parish council, which I'm very proud of. And here are the results of my efforts. This is Thornton's post office. Now boarded up and with a sale sign, the once mainstay of a village now faces an uncertain future. I think it's, it's um, a real worry, a real concern that the post office is closing. It's been there for years, obviously the, the postmaster has uh, retired and you know, she's, she's worked long and hard there which is, you know, so you know, she's really uh, provided for the community but it is, it, it is somewhere that, that I use regularly. Uh, I got my newspaper delivered uh, f from, the, from the post office but that's, that's also the thing. You know, uh, even though there is this suggestion that it is just temporary, you think about things from newspaper delivery uh, for people who can't just walk up to the to the shop every day uh, and and buy a newspaper. It, it's it's their key to the world. Sometimes you know that coming through the door, but also you're thinking about uh, banks locally, high street banks closing. It it's. It offers that banking service, it offers um, mail delivery service as well, people go in there to, to, to send mail from that point. And so who suffers the most from that? It's the elderly, people who, uh, the, the more vulnerable, those who can't walk or travel long distances or don't have a car, and uh, of, of course also uh, the, the, the vulnerable. The statistics from Citizens Advice convey the seriousness of the situation. Since 2020, 1,291 post offices have been deemed temporarily closed. However, 6 in 10 of those never reopen. It, it, it's great that, that it has been suggested that it is a temporary closure and they're looking to find another location in Thornton or near to Thornton to open a new post office. But if that doesn't happen, and when you just say six in ten, that actually doesn't happen, that's a real concern. Yeah, it is. It's uh, not only not only for the 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 fact of people having to travel long distances as well. You, you've got the knock-on effects. You've got the knock-on effects of the crescent uh, up at the crescent. You see, there's a couple of empty shops now, a couple of em empty units, and. Uh, and, and the post office was somewhere which would attract footfall. Uh, other businesses would sh would certainly benefit from the fact that the post office is open. And with that being closed, if that becomes a long-term closure, uh, in actual fact a permanent closure and not just temporary, then that would be, I, I believe, devastating for the community. Although you always see us on screen, we have a mega news team producing the website Mersey News Live and our fortnightly magazine along with radio bulletins. Like us, they cover news and features from around the region and their readership comes from as far afield as America and Finland. We caught up with some of them earlier today. So it's face to face or on the phone that I probably could not have done two years ago when we started. I really enjoyed doing the Santa Dash. I think that was quite good because we got a press pass, so we got to like look behind the scenes a bit. Um, and then I got to interview Jamie Carragher with Tess, so I think that was a real highlight. I really enjoyed writing the story um, about the Chief Constable. She came in and we interviewed her, um, and we got to do a double page spread on the magazine, and we also wrote a story on the day. So it was like being in a real newsroom because we had to turn it around quite quickly, so that was fun. So what's been your highlight of the past year? Highlight of the past year with the news days, um, probably an interview I did with a trans comedian that was really insightful. Um, probably the story I'm proudest of as well. I interviewed a comedian for about about a new open mic night that you were starting, and it was it was really interesting the interview and to actually be able to go and interview someone in person, you know, after being stuck at home doing Zoom interviews for a year, it was great. Um, yeah, being able to just actually go and go and do things. You know, being able to use the facilities, being able to interview people, yeah, just, just that really, being able to actually get 
get involved a bit more. And some of them are here with us, Nigel. What are you most proud of this year in terms of the news that you've produced? Um, I did a story for the magazine about something called the Turtle Song Project, which was about uh, professional musicians being paired up with people suffer, suffering with dementia and memory loss, and together they made um, a few songs and uh, did a concert at the end of the programme, and I in, uh, interviewed one of the organisers of it. And it was nice. Thank you. And uh, how about you? Um, well, other than the Santa Dash, um, I quite like doing the World AIDS Quilt Memorial. I did that with Kitty. Um, so yeah, I think that was really interesting. Thank you so much for that. There are great stories there. And that's it for another year. But we can't sign off without bringing down our production team today. Romy Grigg, Joe Foley, Emma Carter and Giovanna Thompson and, and Joe Zebedee. Come on and too. take... Come on down and take a bow, and then we'll get back on with our dissertations. Take a bow. Come on, bye.